a privilege and joy to be with you guys once again. Sure love Wednesday nights and hanging with you guys. Well, hey, um, we'll do our video thing like we normally do. And so we'll get that started here just after I pray. Uh, and we'll let all those who are enjoying their food come in. Uh, Matt's enjoying his pizza, that looks like. That's good. <clears throat> all right. Wait, well, hey, let's pray and then we'll go to the video. Heavenly Father, thank you for another wonderful a chance to be with your people, uh, understanding uh, that we are family, and that we have been gifted because of grace, the privilege and joy of being in your family. And we thank you that even as we come into the room, we are bonded together by the working of the Holy Spirit and the bonds of peace and uh, also around your word, uh, which is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And I do pray tonight that as we talk about a very important subject, uh, the sufficiency and the importance, the vitality, the inerrancy, uh, the credibility, the validity of your word, uh, that you would allow us to to walk away grown and matured. Uh, You would allow us to be ready to defend uh, the beauty of scripture and that you would help our friends and family who are lost in some of these aberrant and false belief systems uh, to have their eyes opened, and you would give us the chance to, to share the truth with them. And so we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's watch. That was free. I just threw that in. That was free. I just threw that in. It's just absolutely free. So here he says, they prospered through the prophesying. So is it possible, and let's just take prosperity of soul, prosperity relationship, prosperity in family life, prosperity financially, prosperity in employment, in your workplace, the favor, all all these things fit into the area of prosperity. So let's let's just make prosperity broad on this one. They prospered according to the prophesying. Is it possible that the prosperity you have longed for was already made available through a word you didn't value. Is it possible that the prosperity you know you were born for, and I'm not talking about, you know, palaces and stuff. I'm talking about the abundance of God in my life to make me capable to be effective in service in any environment he puts me into. Whether it's the giving of money, the giving of prophetic word, laying hands on the sick, living an example of victory in family life, etc. It's just that prosperity of soul. So is it possible that the prosperity we know we were born for, that we ate, or, or, that we ate for, was actually made available to us through a word we didn't have value for? Those are mine. (laughs) This one is for all of you. It's for Bethel. When we make a decision as a team, one of the things I would do, we'll talk together, we have a decision to make, we, we look at pros and cons, we're trying to hear the voice of the Lord. The one thing I try to make sure that we always do is I will ask the question, 
have we ever had a prophetic word about this decision? So we'll talk together. We'll say, Cindy Jacobs was here 10 years ago. Do you remember that word she gave? And we'll do a little research. We'll try to find the word. Did she talk about this at all? Why? Because we want to prosper and we want to be successful. And both of those two outcomes are contingent upon our response to those in the body he has equipped to bring us exactly what we need. That was free. I just threw that in. It's just absolutely free. No, no, Bill, we don't want it again. Thank you. We're, 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 we're good. We don't need it free. Um, well, I, I understand, you know, that that's not the most scintillating video that we've watched uh, throughout the last six weeks. Um, not the most exciting. Uh, but to me, that, that is the most theologically and ecclesiologically heartbreaking video uh, that we've, we've seen yet. Uh, and I, I want to make sure you understand what you're seeing there. And, and I'm, you know, for those of you who came in late especially, what you're seeing is a guy who has a, a global following and repeatedly in a very underhanded and congenial way, uh, he's undermining scripture. And, and what you just saw there was, you know, he's setting aside the word of God. And he's going back and referring to these notebooks, apparently, of people who have given a word from the Lord over the years and whatever those words are. And then what he tells his church is that whenever we have a big decision to make, I go to my prophetic notebooks and then we just start reading through them and that's how we make our decisions. And then, you know, the crowd kind of cheers and, and oohs and ahs. Uh, and I want to make sure that everyone has an understanding of, of what's happening, because that's not just Bethel anymore. In, in the old days, that was kind of the weird churches. But nowadays, that's moved into evangelicalism. Some of the names that were so mainstream, I mean, Mark Driscoll, Francis Chan, Bill Hybels, these guys are saying, I lead my church, and I lead people off of a whisper from the Lord, a prophetic word from the Lord, uh, I'm an apostle, I'm called to move and touch people here, and the Lord spoke to me and told me. This is now mainstream, where the word of God is put off to the side, and then some other word is what we now make our decisions based off. And, and, and here's where I think we need to make sure we all understand the rubber meets the road. That is undermining the very Reformation itself. That, that's how big this is at a macro level. It's undermining the very Reformation itself. Uh, what makes a person reformed, end quote, is not just, you know, I believe in the sovereignty of God and salvation, right? You know, that's all part of it. You know, it's Ephesians 1, and people get really pumped about those things. But historically, what the reformers said was they, with Rome... And the church, the papal system, saying that not only do we obey the, the Bible, but we also now submit to extra-biblical authority via the church and via the pope. It was the reformers who went back and said, we don't submit to anything outside of Scripture. Sola Scriptura. And that's what it means to, to be reformed. The Scriptures are our authority. So, so when we have evangelicalism moving this direction where we got guys standing up saying, yeah, let's put the Bible off to the side and we're going to go get our notebooks and we're going to go through this when we make our decisions, what we're, we're seeing is an undercutting of historic Protestant theology. Very, very important to understand the scale of this. And so what we're going to talk about here, we're going to kind of back into our topic, which is prophecy, and really what these guys are doing, which is a deuteroprophetic kind of secondary prophecy, they would call it. And we're going to back into that by starting with the building block of the sufficiency of Scripture. And so if you got your Bibles there and you got your notes ready to go, let's start plowing. Let's begin in Hebrews chapter 1. Uh, Hebrews chapter 1. Beautiful letter, a series of seven sermons, uh, so aptly and well compiled. And if you're a note taker, you can go ahead and just fill in the blank here as we begin to circle on this idea of the sufficiency of Scripture, meaning Scripture is enough for all maturing in the faith. Don't need anything atop it, don't need anything on the side of it, don't need any authority above it. 
or beside it or below it. There's only one thing we need, which is the scriptures. That's where we're going tonight. So number one there in your notes, scripture is sufficient because of Christ. Scripture is sufficient because of Christ. So in Hebrews chapter 1, let's begin reading right at the top. Ephesians 1.1, 1, 1. God, after he spoke, long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways. Of course, everyone here would understand that. You know, over the course of progressing revelation, which we'll talk about, God spoke in, in many different ways. Uh, sometimes it was visions and dreams and different prophets, major prophets, minor prophets, of course, even times poetry uh, and in Proverbs uh, over the course of many thousands of years. But verse 2, and here's our key, in these last days God has spoken to us in his Son, whom we appointed the heir of all things. Now, if you got a pen there, you could just circle this. This verse couldn't be more clear about the foundation of Revelation. God had spoken in many ways, but then Christ is the culmination of revelation. And we're living in those final days. What he calls here the last days, or what we could call the final age, the the church age, before Jesus returns and he makes all things new. Uh, Basically, a lot of times this is called progressing or progressive revelation. One of the ways you might want to picture, by the way, progressive revelation would simply be picture a skyscraper or a building. And way back in the beginning with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, you remember that God said a few things to Adam and Eve. He said, hey, don't eat of one tree in the Garden of Eden. He gave them a little bit of instruction, and they probably knew him better than uh, than we were ever able to tell, but that's what he gave them. Don't eat of the one tree in the middle of the garden, uh, and then I want you to be fruitful. I want you to multiply. And then a little bit later, God spoke to Noah, and he gave him some information and said, hey, I've cleansed the world after the flood, and I want you to go and be fruitful and multiply. Then after that, he gave Abraham some instructions. All I want you to do, Abe, is just go out to a new land. I'm going to make that land and your your, your progeny a wonderful nation. And then he spoke to Moses and he said, I'm going to give you the law and I'm going to create a nation unto myself from you. And so basically, we have the building blocks going up in the levels of the tower. By the time we get to Christ and his arrival on planet Earth and the apostles have the beauties of Christ that they extol and proclaim around the world, we get the fullness of God, the fullness of understanding who he is because of Jesus. We know who the Father is. We know who the Holy Spirit is. We understand how the Trinity works. And the apostles finish the canon and they send it around the world, which, by the way, means that we know so much more than any of those other people ever could have imagined. I think we a lot of times take that for granted, don't we? You know, we go, well, what would it be like to be Moses? Or what would it be like to to be Abraham, right? But think about all that we know. We just assume so much. We know how it all began. We know how it's all going to end. We know we're going to be taken up. We know the kingdom is going to come down. We know so much that these guys never could have comprehended because we live in the final age. At the top of the skyscraper, seeing the whole entire picture of progressing revelation over the course of some 6,000 years. Now, the implications of that are staggering. And so if you have a pen, you could just write these in the notes or in your margin. The implications are staggering about God speaking in these diverse ways and in the fullness of his Son in the final age. Number one would be that God is a speaking God. And that's very important to understand. God actually is a speaking God. He's a communicating God. He decided to inform his creatures of who he was. And he did it in a variety of ways. But number two would be that there were actual creatures that needed that information. Man is natural. We're finite. We're bound in time and space. We all know that. We're bound in time and space. We might feel that there's a supernatural. We might be able to sense that there's something outside of what we can see because God has revealed the creation and we go, somebody had to have made that. But here's the key. We never would have known about it unless what? The supernatural came in and spoke to the natural. See, God had to come in and he had to speak for us to be able to understand who he was. The infinite has to reveal himself to the finite for the finite to be able to have any understanding of who or what the infinite is. And we all see that every day. I I like to think of it this way. God was condescending to do baby talk for us. That's what he did. He's giving humanity just enough every step of the way to fulfill and continue his redemptive plan, and he did it by giving us what we could handle at that particular time. 
Uh, that, of course, is baby talk coming from an infinite creator. I mean, we do it all the time. You know, earlier, I was walking in, and Jade was out there, baby Jade, and she was standing there, and there was a whole crowd. You know, she always has a little crowd around her. You see that? And she does that big smile. You know, but what nobody was doing was talking about quantum physics or the issues with government and sociology right now. Right? Nobody was talking. What were they doing with baby Jade? They were coming down. Everyone was kneeling. You get down real low, and then what do you do? You go, oh, do boo do do boo do you know? <laughs> Fist bump, fist bump. Can you give high five, high five, right? Now that's only coming from adult humans down to, to baby humans. Imagine from one creature like a human down to an entirely different species like a dog. How do I condescend to my dog Pepper? Pepper sit. Pepper come. Pepper bed. She's got like three commands. And I have to say them just that way for her to be able to obey me. And she doesn't really usually obey me anyway, Right? But I'm condescending. What about an ant? Let's go even lower. Can you imagine trying to communicate and trying to tell an ant about the freeways going around or the big creatures called, you know, organic human beings? He would have no clue. All he sees is the breadcrumb and the little hole in the ground he's supposed to get to with his buddies. And we're trying to, we have to condescend. Imagine how much an infinite creator has to condescend to communicate to you and to me. So he's a speaking God. Which is what actually makes something very interesting. In fact, you want to put this in big, bold caps somewhere in your Bible. Is notice that there's the box, and for all you who come out of the NAR and the charismatic movement, get ready. There's a box that exists for natural man who's time-bound. And the infinite creator had to step into that box. And here's what's interesting is... These guys are always saying, don't put God in a box. That's one thing they talk about. You have a dead church. You put God in a box. He doesn't do wild things. You don't believe it. Listen, friends, let's be really, really clear. And if anyone's watching online, let's be really clear. See, we didn't put God in a box. God put you in a box. And God stepped into that box and condescended and revealed himself to you. And if the infinite hadn't stepped into your box, you wouldn't have any idea who he was. Trust me, he ain't in a box. He's outside the box. You're in the box. Got to make sure we understand who's in the box and who isn't. Now, here's where this culminates. Scriptures tell the story of Jesus. The Old Testament predicted him. The Gospels describe him. The epistles explain him. And the revelation by John promises him, meaning his return. See, that's what the Scriptures are. They're the condescending of God to reveal to people in Christ the fullness of who he is so that we have everything that we need See, Christ is our sufficiency, and Scripture is sufficient because of Christ. And that kind of jettisons us right to point number two. So the foundation of this whole thing is Christ. In the final days, the last days, he spoke to us through Christ, the fulfillment of progressive revelation. And then number two, the Scripture is sufficient, and it was sufficient for the apostles. So number one, it was sufficient because of Christ, but notice number two, that it was sufficient for the apostles. And if you got your Bible there in Hebrews, jump back just a few pages to Jude, that little letter uh, written by probably the half-brother of Jesus. And, and let me show you Jude's thoughts uh, specifically on the Scripture. And of course, you understand this entire letter is written uh, to defend the faith from error. We don't know what kind of uh, issues he was dealing with, probably up in Asia Minor, one of Paul's churches, uh, Dan Wallace believes. And uh, we think that probably it was a Phrygian folk tale causing some kind of mystical uh, mysticism, some kind of Gnostic mysticism. Uh, all we know is that he started to write here about salvation, and he got sidetracked. And here's that famous statement. Pick it up in verse 3. He said, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith. So he says, I was making every effort to write about your salvation, but then something happened, we don't know if he got a letter, and he felt the necessity to write appealing that you now contend earnestly for. Now here's the key, and if you got a pen, just circle these. He says the faith. It's not the verb, it's not believing, it's not the action of pistuo. What he's actually saying is the faith, the body of faith, for him it would have been the Old Testament scriptures, the objective sum, and then look at what he calls it, which was once for all, delivered to the saints. Aorist passive, meaning past complete action. It was a God-given revelation. It's passive because God did it. It's aorist tense because it was done. It's completed. 
And he actually says, the Old Testament canon was done by God and it is completed. He calls it the faith. And he says, I want you to contend earnestly for the faith. Now that brings up a really, really important foundation that we need to make sure we understand. The apostles time and again, get this, no matter how amazing their experiences were, and they had the best of experiences. We, t- we talked about them the last three weeks. The apostles authenticating the new work of God called the church, right? And yet no matter how amazing their experiences were, guess what they always revert back to as their source of authority? Can you guess? Scripture. Well, let me show you. Number one with Paul's promises. Let me look at this. Turn back, if you're in Jude, just a few pages to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. And look at what Paul promises here about Scripture. Uh, this is one of those I'm sure you all have memorized. All Scripture is inspired by God. And profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. He's writing to his protege in the faith. But just real quick, let's glance through these together and make sure we've wrapped our mind around what the apostles themselves are saying about the validity of Scripture. So 2 Timothy 3.16. All Scripture, apostograph is inspired, theanustas, it's God-breathed, and profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. Now here's the key, verse 17. Read it with me. That the man of God may be adequate. That that literally means teleos. He says perfected, entirely matured for what? Some good works? Partial good works. Sometimes good works. For for what good work? He says you're going to be perfected because of the scripture for every good work fascinating you have an apostle and he looks at his young protege and he says the old testament scriptures and he's a man who knows as an apostle he's actually writing scripture which would be inscripturated at times jesus has spoken to him directly and he looks back at the entire canon of old testament scripture and he says timothy i know what i'm saying matters but really all you need in order to be godly are the scriptures fascinating statement by an apostle Uh, let, let me show you his example too Go back a little further to Acts chapter 17. Look at this one. Acts chapter 17 is uh, remarkable because what you're doing, we're all getting a snapshot of Paul on his missionary journeys. This is specifically in Thessalonica. And this is an interesting moment as he's rolling through and he's hitting the synagogues. Uh, And uh, Acts chapter 17, pick it up in verse 2. According to Paul's custom, I mean, this is the way he, he rolled, specifically because he's talking with the Jews first, he went to them, and for three Sabbaths, he reasoned with them from the what? You see that? Explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer. Here's an apostle. He's got all authority, yet he goes back to the previous authority of Scripture when he's rolling into town and he's teaching people the truth about Jesus and about the infant church and about the gospel. Fascinating. Now, let's look at one more. This one may be the most critical statement in the New Testament in regards to the apostles' viewpoints on prophecy uh, and the validity of Scripture. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 1, and I'm sure that you guys also recognize 2 Peter is dealing with false prophets. Kind of same thing, a group of guys, sordid gain, materialism, uh, going after the ladies, and Paul or Peter is writing against that. Uh, The whole letter is basically about that. But look at how he begins by setting up his own experience, which if anybody had the right to talk about experience, it was Peter. (laughs) Peter got the best and the worst, right? Now look at 2 Peter chapter 1 and pick it up in verse 16. He says, We did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he says off right, right from the beginning. This isn't about tales. It's not about making stuff up. It's not even about the experiences of power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Now he's talking about his experience. I saw him, and I saw things that people could not fathom, witnesses of his majesty. Anybody know already what he's talking about? What did he witness that would have showcased the majesty of Jesus? The majesty meaning the holiness, the otherness, the Shekinah glory, that would have been Matthew chapter 17, the Mount of... Let's look at it. There we go, verse 17. For when he received honor and glory for God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory. He says, God the Father came down. I saw it happen. And what did he say to him? This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. What a powerful moment. Matthew 17, Mount of Transfiguration. He says, verse 18, we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. So I don't know if you remember the story. I'm sure most of you do. 
you know, Moses and Elijah show up, and then Peter, James, and John are there, and Matthew tells us they, they fall comatose. So when Jesus changes, and they see him for who he really is, remember Philippians chapter 2, he's veiled himself when he came here from all the glory and the angelic subservience and everything that he had as the honor, power, dominion, and authority in heaven. He comes down here, he veils himself. For a split second, he lets them see they all fall comatose on the ground. Remember that? And Moses and Elijah come, then finally Peter wakes back up, and what does he say? Let's build a couple tabernacles here for you. And (laughs) Jesus is like, man, Peter, just stop talking, right? So that's Peter's experience. He says, I have experienced things that are better than anything you all could fathom. But then look what he says in verse 19. And so we have the prophetic word made what? More sure. Isn't that fascinating? And depending on your translation, it could be instead we have the prophetic word made more sure. The prophetic word of Scripture is more sure, he says, than even my experience on the Mount of Transfiguration. Keep reading. To which you would do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. You said you think the Mount of Transfiguration was bright? You have no idea how bright prophetic Scripture is. That is what's bright. That's what moves the heart, he says. But know this, verse 20, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved along by the Holy Spirit from God. He says, even my own experience could have been misinterpreted, but the Word of God cannot be. Fascinating that Peter himself doesn't build on experience, but the more sure word of Scripture The revelation of God via the prophets was more certain to him and to his listeners. In fact, you always remember in Revelation chapter 22, verse 18, how John closes uh, his beautiful book, uh, the Apocalypse, written on the island of Patmos. Remember what he says? He says, I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God shall add to him the plagues which are written in this book. You remember that? You ever read that? Here's John sitting on the island of Patmos in 90 AD. He's looking back over the whole course and the whole history of this beautiful work of Christ coming to earth and all of his buddies who've already died. And he says, listen, I'll make it really, really clear. I'm writing what's about to happen. If you touch this and you add to it or you delete from it, you better get ready because the scourge of God is going to fall upon you. This is the sure word. You got the apostles themselves saying, this is what we trust. Even more than the Mount of Transfiguration, even more than sitting here getting visions from Christ, this is what we trust. We trust the Word. Which brings up a real important question, doesn't it? Do you you sense the question? Why were the apostles so careful when it came to to prophecy and to Scripture? Why were they so careful? What do you think the answer is to that? Reverence. Right? Right? It had a high view of God. And if it didn't clearly come from God, they didn't say that it came from God because they understood scriptures like Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 20. You remember that one? But the prophet who shall speak a word presumptuously in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or which he shall speak in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. See, what these guys understood was you don't, you don't walk around and play willy-nilly with words from the Lord. You don't walk around and play willy-nilly with a prophecy. You don't walk around and play games with the idea that I'm going to give you words of knowledge that I've inherited from heaven. You don't mess around with revelation. Now, now I want to press just a little bit further. Okay? What did Jesus use to teach the apostles before he went back to heaven? Do you remember? Jesus, the Son of God, who's just authenticated himself by coming back from the dead, resurrection, and what does he do when he's instructing the apostles before they start their ministry? Do you remember what he uses? Let's just do one more. Luke chapter 24, real quick. Look at this. Luke chapter 24. Of course, Jesus now has come back from the dead. He's got 50 days or so where he's floating around with the disciples. Uh, And then these are the same men, by the way, and just a couple months later, they're going to stand up and they're going to preach the word of God no matter what happens, even if they're put in jail. (laughs) Peter, the guy who's running away and hiding. 
two months later is standing up and willing to die for this thing? What happened in between? Well, the Holy Spirit, he filled and indwelt Peter, number one. But what else? Luke chapter 24, look at verse 27. Jesus is meeting with these men for about 50 days in between his resurrection and his ascension. And look at what he's doing with them. Verse 27, And beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all of the what? Now, I don't know if you see the beauty of that. I, I, I find that almost, I just find that the most fascinating thing. The risen Son of God. You remember Thomas? He just walked into the room through a door and Thomas falls to his knees and says what? You are my Lord and my God. Everywhere he went, these men understood this was in fact God. And yet for for 40 days, what does he do? He gets him in a room and he opens up the scriptures and he starts doing seminary training with the guys. And two months later, they stand up and they're ready to die for the truth because the Holy Spirit's inside of them, but also because they finally understood the what? They understood the scriptures. Even Jesus said, this is what I use. This is what I use. Scripture is sufficient because of Christ. It's sufficient for the apostles. Uh, Let me go ahead and move forward here with you, friends, and make it personal. Scripture is sufficient for today. So let's back in a little more now to our subject at hand, into prophecy. I think it's important to understand what the Scriptures say about its sufficiency. And now let's move it into the more practical. So Scripture is sufficient for today. There's two possibilities when it comes to Revelation. Only two. Wayne Gruden tried to invent a third in 1994 in his systematic theology, but he failed horribly. He couldn't answer his own issues. Chapter 51 to 53, he tried really hard, but he couldn't answer it because he created a conundrum that you cannot answer. There's only two historic realities when it comes to prophecy and revelation. Okay, here they are. Number one is historical objectivity. We call it the historical objective view. Now, this would be the view of the Orthodox church early on. This would be the Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed. This would be the view uh, of the Reformers. This would be the view, really, of historic Protestantism at large. It's very simple. The idea is, is that all of my ideas and my experiences are always judged, validated, or invalidated through the Scriptures. Very simple. My, thio- my, my, my experiences are defined by my theology, okay? Now, here's the other side. You ready? Way over here. There's two options. Other than the historic objective is the personal subjective. Historically, this would have been the Catholic dogma. This would have bled into the the, the neo-Orthodox liberals. This would ultimately bleed into the Mormons, into the Jehovah Witnesses, and ultimately into the NER and the Charismatics. And any group that says we define our theology through community, through relics, through experiences, instead of my theology being defined by my experience, I define my theology by my experience. Those are two dramatically different things. And there's no middle. There can be no mediating. Either the Bible is my my guide, my rule for faith and practice, or some level of experience becomes my rule of faith and practice. And there is no middle ground, historical objective or personal subjective. And that's why, going back to our video, guys like Bill Johnson and all the apostles and the Heidi Bakers and the Randy Clarks, and just go on and on and on, they eventually have to admit that they are not satisfied with what? Scripture. Bill Johnson, in his seminal work, When Heaven Invades Earth, said, just quote him, We've come as far as we can with our current understanding of Scripture. It's time to let new signs have their place. There it is. Uh, Randy Clark, who had emailed me a couple of years ago, uh, is a super apostle, end quote, a vertical apostle, or whatever they call it, for the NAR. Uh, here's what he said in one of his experiences when it comes to prophecy. He said, you know, I told the Lord that I'd been using the Bible, but I wanted to go a little further. And so I I told him I was going to start speaking out my impressions. Uh, When I received them in my mind, because I'd been playing it too safe, in the most prevalent way, 
uh, that I received words of prophecy was by feeling physical pain corresponding to a condition in someone whom the Lord wanted to heal in the room. I don't even know what that means. I, I, don't, I don't know what it means. But he goes on and he says, So while worshiping, I received five impressions. And I told the people, I don't know if these last five words are really from the Lord. Now, now, I, uh, see, you got to stop talking right there. You gotta, you gotta, he, he got up and he told the people, I don't know, and we're going to come back to this in just a moment. I want to fill in the blanks on these, okay? I don't know if these last five words are really from the Lord. Now, Randy, if you ever listen to this, go read Deuteronomy chapter 18 again, brother, because you're in dangerous territory. You're claiming words from the Lord, and you're admitting you're not even sure if they're from the Lord. And then he says, the words that came to my mind that night in New Mexico were uh, artesia and artisan, 17 staples, maritime, and crowbar. And the words, he says, were all correct. There was an artisan from Artesia in the room, a person who had complications from surgery that involved 17 staples, a pastor who had recently had an accident on a boat, and there was a woman who had been beaten by her ex with a crowbar, end quote. Now, I just want to make sure that we all understand what he's saying. He's saying that I get an idea in my mind, and I throw out the words like jello on the wall, now, if you have a group of 500 or 800 or 1,000 people, you, you can throw out five words and, and somebody's going to run up to you and go, hey, that hit me personally, man. You, that's a word from God. You come up with anything and that would happen. You, you write supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. Ah, I watched Mary Poppins today. You, you can always find something that somebody can attribute once you've manipulated them by the music and by the ethos and the culture of the room to believe that it's God. A crowbar, how many people saw a crowbar that day? It's fascinating to me. Now let me talk to you about the issues with this real quick. And I put them there on your sheet just so we can highlight them. Number one is going back to what we already talked about. When we talk about a deuteropropheic, meaning a dual prophecy, it's sitting aside the word of God. It's competing with the Word of God. It's over above the Word of God. It's a secondary prophecy surrounding the Word of God. It's not authoritative like the Word of God, but they say it is. All that stuff. Here's some of the key issues you're going to face. Number one, the New Testament, as we just saw, highlights the study of Scripture, not voices from above. And if you're taking notes, that would just be the New Testament highlights study, not voices. We just saw it from Peter. We saw it from Paul. We saw it from Jude. We uh, Philip did the same thing in Acts chapter 8, verse 35. Remember that? He sees the Ethiopian eunuch. He's going to baptize him. It says, Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from the Scripture, he preached Jesus to him. 2 Timothy 2.15, 2 Timothy 3.16, Acts chapter 17, verse 11, Acts chapter 8, verse 35. The pattern in the Bible is that the men were teaching people the Scriptures. Uh, but now let's move into the more practical. We've already seen the New Testament highlights study of Scripture not voices, but now we're getting into the existential and the theological. Here's the key, friends. God never speaks non-authoritatively. And this is where Gruden couldn't reconcile in systematic theology. He couldn't reconcile this issue. God never can speak non-authoritatively. D does everyone understand that? Either God speaks or he doesn't. And when God speaks, he speaks. You, can you imagine in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and you know, let there be light, and like the lightning bolt is sitting there going, not quite sure if you meant that. No, that's hyperbolic, but think, think about it. That's, he's a speaking God. And the word tells us he stepped into, and even tells us how he did it, right? There it is. Let's, let's put it more into the practical. How about Moses on Mount Sinai? How's that? The mountain is thunder and lightning, and then there's a hundred yards around the outside of the perimeter, and the rocks are still there. You can still go visit today if you can sneak into Iran. You can actually see, you know, where the burnt top of the mountain is and everything. You can go visit it. Can you imagine the thunder and the lightning up there, and everyone's standing back in fear. It's rumbling, and then God's speaking a whisper and says, Thou shalt not murder. And what's Moses doing? Are you sure, God? I'm not sure. It's impossible. When God speaks, he speaks. It's not like he speaks one time and it's serious and the next time it's optional. It, 
Which leads to the next one. The New Testament highlights the study of Scripture, not voices. Because God never speaks non-authoritatively. And here's the problem, friends. They've invented a new category. An entirely new category. I would much prefer for any of these guys who are actual believers that you all would just pull back and they would start calling it guidance calling it impressions or calling it promptings. Do whatever you want, but do not call it revelation or a word from God. Because number four, when you do that, sola scriptura is out or gone. The moment you've done that, you've created new revelation. People running around And if everyone's getting new revelation, then the uniqueness of Scripture is out, and it's theological chaos, and it's a free-for-all, which we've seen the last now five weeks. These churches are in theological chaos. Because you've got no objective center. Cameron and Macy are going to get married in a year, right? We're all excited for them. You know, I heard baby Jade's your flower girl, right? Beautiful. That's wonderful. Um... So you guys get married. Let's just, let's just say you get married in a year and you're having a great first year and it's going really well and you, know, you finally have your first, we'll call it a discussion. <laughs> you know, you're so kind, you may never. You'll go 50 years without one, but I would assume you, you, you would have one, right? You know, Cameron, you, 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 you know, you expect her to make you a carne asada, you know, something, <laughs> Right? And, you know, Macy, you expect him to be home by, by 6 from work. Not 6.05. 6. And when he's late, if the carne asada is not up or he's at 6.05, you know, problems can, can happen. Now, what happens in a home, all jokes aside, what happens in a home if you're, if you're, if you're both saying, I got words for, from God? How do, Cameron, if you come home and say, hey, listen, the Lord, the Lord was talking to me on the way home. He was moving in my heart. And he just said, spend an extra five minutes praying in the car. So that's why I'm late, honey. Now, she comes to you. She says, I was cooking, you know, and I was chopping up and dicing the onions. And as I was dicing the onions, you know what, Cameron? God told me that uh, I needed to just, 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 just be praying for you. And if you were home at six, then that would mean that you loved me as much as I loved you. So you come in the door. You share your word from the Lord. Macy, you share your word from the Lord. Who's, who, who's right? Now, that's a silly illustration. Here's why I say it. Now, imagine when you as a couple, you come into the church and you say, hey, we got a word from the Lord. But Renee Seves says, hold on a second. Now, I got a different one. Now, that's a silly illustration until we take it up a notch. You ready? Now, you guys come from your Bible group and you come to one of your pastors and they're saying, thus saith the Lord. You're going, no, hold on a second. We got a word from the Lord. Listen closely. The way that God designed us is that we're all under a structure of authority. He designed that for our safety and for our joy. The children are under the authority of their mother, under the authority of their father, under the authority of their under-shepherds and their pastors, or under the authority of God, and that's the way that it works. And we all love when that authority is working in our favor, right? Cameron, you'll be really happy when you're able to just watch Macy cultivated in a church where she's following and respecting and submitting to you because of the word of God in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22, 23, tell her to. You're going to be loving that, right? But the moment you break away and go, I'm hearing from the words of the Lord, I don't follow authority, now how are you going to be able to go to your wife and expect her to do the same? The moment we do this, the substructure of a church begins to fall apart. Because you either lead a church by personal manipulation or biblical revelation. And the moment it's personal manipulation, it all begins to fall apart. See, it's a Luciferian subterfuge. And it destroys churches, which leads us to the last one there. Here's the default. It always defaults, ready, into false religions. Experientialism always will default. Uh, Catholic dogma, neo-Orthodox liberals, Mormonism, Joseph Smith. I, I want to be careful with this, but I'm going to throw it in anyway. Even serial killers, what's the one thing in common with all of them? They all said, I heard voices. I do what I want based off what I heard. And the moment you go there, all bets are off. So, Scripture is sufficient because of Christ. Scripture is sufficient for the apostles. It's sufficient for today. And let's just bring it all the way down, bring the cookies all the way down to the bottom shelf. Scripture is sufficient for you and me. You got to hold on to that. You got to just trust the Word of God. And there's three reasons I gave you there at the bottom of your page. Number one is because Christianity is based in the mind, 
It's meant for the mind. It's meant to go from the mind to the heart, that 12 inches. It starts in the mind. That's why God spoke and then God had it written. That's why it's there. If you want to know God, you've got to study his word. There's no maturity or purity apart from the word of God. Finish it with me. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your, your mind. How about John 17, 17? Sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. See, that's the way it works. And understand, number two there at the bottom, experiential theology isn't new. None of this is new. Paganism goes all the way back to Babel. The Old Testament is full of demons, orgies, mutilation, child sacrifice, ecstasy, and oracles. And by the way, that's why all this stuff looks so similar to the African cults like the Kundalini spirit right here. If you watch what these people do and you go watch the cultist, you'll see how much they merge because it's all very similar. And then number three, here's the ultimate problem. The moment you go here, there's no test for experience. There's no test. If your spiritual life is based off experience, you don't know what's true and you don't know what's false. You don't know what's God and you don't know what's caffeine or acid indigestion. You you don't know. You ever laid in bed at night and done that? Anybody here, you know, you come out of those, that world? You remember when you're laying in bed at night and, and your mind's going a mile a minute and you're feeling things and you're having dreams and you're laying there and you're wondering what God's doing? Show of hands, who comes out of a charismatic background? All right, so half of you. Anybody remember laying in bed at night and just like, and thinking I need to go. Maybe I should get up right now and fall on my face and fast more. You know, what, there, all this, and you're just living in either a manic depressive state. Do you remember that? It was like you're either just so up because God's moving or you're so down, like where did God go? Does anybody remember that? That's because of this. So, so here's what you say. When somebody comes up to you and says, I got a word for the Lord from you, for you. And they're going to prophesy over your life. Aunt Matilda at Thanksgiving or, you know, your, your buddy Joe at Starbucks or wherever. Here's what you say to them. They come up to you. You ready? Cameron, I got a word for the Lord from you, right? Here's what you do. You just pull out your Bible and you say, show me. That's it. And then what you follow it up with is you go, um, I, I, I'm reformed. And then what you say is, is I'm not saying I'm reformed like, you know, I got to be all Ephesians 1. I'm saying I'm reformed because I joined the reformers in saying that I validate and invalidate everything in my life based off of this. That's what Jesus did. That's what the apostles did. That's what Peter did. That's what Paul did. That's what Philip did. And you know what? That's what I do. Now, there's two responses you're going to get. Ready? Number one is they're going to go, hey, tell me more. Or number two is they're going to run for the hills. Because they just met a man or a woman whose rule for life, rule for faith and practice, is the Word of God. All right? Okay. Here's what we'll do. I'm going to pray. Next week, what I'd like to do is shorten down our study to 25 minutes and then maybe do a Q&A. So if you have friends who have questions or whatever, maybe Pastor Desmond or something will have a microphone and we'll just, questions from the whole series. You know, last week I had three or four questions on tongues and continuous. So if you have questions on anything, bring them next week. Uh, I'd love to answer those for you. Uh, And then also I did put a sheet there in your hands on the canonicity of scripture, just a high level, high level overview on how the scripture was developed and how we can trust it to be authoritative. And so take that home and enjoy the reading. And then youth, I think you guys are meeting out in the lobby and all the rest of us will hang out here. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you again for just such a wonderful time to gather and spend 50 minutes, 55 minutes in study. Thank you most of all this evening for giving us your word and allowing us to be able to walk with joy and confidence knowing that we're part of an incredible heritage, not only inheritance, uh, the inheritance of heaven to come, but also the lineage of, of, a, of a puritanistic, reformational, orthodox faith that has lasted 2,000 years and has changed the world. And that we don't got to wake up every morning wondering if you've left us. We don't got to wake up every morning seeking for more fillings and blessings. We don't got to wake up every morning pandering, looking at the skies or nature, hoping that you're going to give us a sign. We get to wake up every single morning knowing that the promises you've made are true. 
and that you loved us so much you sent your son. He threw on skin and he came to earth and he was willing to suffer and die as a man at the hands of brutal men so that he would rise again on the third day, that he would launch this beautiful thing called the church. He would put the word of the living God in our hand and allow us to proceed with confidence and to be victorious in this life. Thank you, thank you, thank you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys.